And I'm very pleased to be introducing our presenter today, Dr. Ben Halpern. Dr. Halpern is the director of the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis and professor in the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. He also received his PhD in marine ecology from UC Santa Barbara and was a postdoctoral fellow and research associate at NCAES until joining the faculty at the Bren School. His research leverages environmental data sets to address a wide range of topics centered on the many ways that human activities are impacting ocean ecosystems and species and the consequences of those impacts on the benefits we receive in return. Dr. Halpern has been named one of the world's most influential scientific minds by Thomson Reuters. He received the A.G. Huntsman Award for Excellence in Marine Science by the Royal Society of Canada, the Peter Benkley Ocean Award for Excellence in Science, and the Ocean Award in Science. He is also a fellow of both the California Academy of Sciences and the Ecological Society of America. It was a mouthful. Welcome, Dr. Halpern. Thanks so much, Lauren, for that wonderful introduction. And to all of you joining online, um, it's always wonderful to be in person, to get to actually see and meet and chat with everyone. But um, this is, of course, more efficient, both for the planet and for everyone else's travel time. So happy to do this virtually. And looking forward to the discussion at the end. And then, of course, beyond, uh, please be in touch afterwards to to talk about um, ideas and things that come out of this presentation. So I'm gonna um, talk about a project that I've been leading for the last five years, trying to understand uh, and map the environmental footprint of, of global food production. And the motivation from this really comes from my decision five years ago to change my diet based on stories I've been reading in the news and talking to friends and colleagues about the environmental consequences of food production and making the choice to uh, take meat out of my diet. But being a good scientist, I thought, well, maybe I should try to you know, use uh, as much data and information as possible to really guide my decisions. So I started looking around in the literature, reading up on what was available, and it quickly became apparent that there wasn't uh, sufficient information to guide the decisions I was trying to make, and that led to the uh, genesis of this project. And of course, thinking about these decisions has all sorts of implications, um, not just for our diet and the health, but for the environment. How do we choose the foods to eat that will um, minimize the impact on our planet while maximizing the ability to, to feed people uh, locally, nationally, and globally. I think a lot of us face this decision, or at least think about it, and so I'm hoping that the stuff I present today provides a little more food for thought, as you might say, for um, the, thing, the decisions you're going to make and the actions you can take to try to make a more sustainable uh, food production system for our planet. Now, you know, there's a lot of different diets out there, you know, vegetarian, vegan, pescatarian, on and on. Some of them are driven by, um, you know, diet fads that um, are, are, people are pushing for various reasons. But behind all of them are usually issues of uh, nutrition, health, or environmental sustainability. And um, this potpourri of options leads many people, myself included, to feel overwhelmed at times about what to eat. What should we think about eating? And so I really wanted to try to answer these kinds of questions through the work we're doing. But to set a little context, uh, maybe many of you know this kind of information already, um, is what the understood kind of environmental consequences of global food production is to date. So it's big. Uh, for example, we use at least 70% of our fresh water for agriculture and food production leaving just 30% for everything else. So by far the dominant um, use of fresh water is for producing food. It also, food production contributes um, somewhere around a third of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we're gonna really address climate problems, climate change problems and mitigate the, the issues, we need to be thinking about food systems both as a source and a potential solution for how to address climate change. 
And we've had a huge amount of our land converted to crops and pasture land, something like 40% of all ice free land on our planet has been converted for the growing of crops or the, uh, the pasture of livestock. Which means uh, biodiversity and other human uses of those spaces have been pushed into the remaining area, uh, which just you know creates all sorts of potential consequences. So you, you've probably seen in the news as I have, uh, things like this, maybe not in this graphical format, but uh, kind of ranking foods against some measure of interest. And in this case, looking at the kilograms of, of CO2 equivalents or the climate emissions from food production, and you can rank the foods based on this metric. In this case, uh, you may not actually know that um, sheep and goats are actually worse than cows in terms of climate emissions. You've probably heard a lot about cow emissions. They are also um, quite high, but you get this rank order of foods and you can see a couple things immediately here. Like one, not every food is on this plot. And uh, two, uh, they are only looking at climate emissions, which is, of course, just one part of the consequence of food production for our planet. And so these gaps really motivated in a big way what we were trying to do with this research. So first of all, as I just mentioned, most of the studies have been siloed either on one food type, like uh, livestock, or on one issue like climate emissions. And to really understand the environmental consequence of food production, we really need the comprehensive and comparable measures of multiple stressors across all foods. So that was the first gap we addressed. The second is truly the vast majority of research to date has focused on these measures of either per kilogram or per pound efficiency of food production. And this is absolutely useful for personal decisions because we eat a kilogram of food a day or whatever. And so our personal choices are on the scale of kilograms of food. But of course, food production is not just those per kilogram efficiencies, but also the total production volume of food. So you can have something that has a really bad environmental consequence, but if you grow very, very little of it, it doesn't really matter or you can have something that has a medium amount of environmental pressure associated with it, but if you grow a lot of it, it can make a huge difference. So we really need to be accounting for production volume in our assessments as well. And then finally, and I think maybe the biggest innovation of what we did with this work was to address where these pressures are. So most of the studies, as you saw in that bar graph, don't tell you where the production is happening or account for the variation from place to place on how efficient they might be. And so we put a lot of effort into mapping where these pressures are occurring, where they're overlapping and where they're concentrated so that we can get a sense of the spatial distribution of these environmental footprints of food production. So I'm going to tell the story of our research in five chapters or five messages that I'd, I'd love for you to take away from this work um, that focuses on mapping the global food footprint. Before I do that, though, I want to set the stage of the methods that we used and the data that we incorporated so that you get a sense of what's under the hood as you get these five chapters of information from this work. So first of all, we um, look at these four broad categories of food production. So livestock, the animals on land, aquaculture, uh, the freshwater and marine uh, growing of fish, shellfish, uh, we didn't look at seaweed, uh, crops, the huge variety of crops that um, are grown around the world, and then wild caught fisheries. So we have these four categories of broad categories of food that we keep track of. Within each of these categories of food, we keep track or measure and, and map these different aspects of the food production that lead to environmental pressures. So let's look at livestock, for example. We have livestock manure, which produces you know, greenhouse gas emissions as well as nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. We have the feed that goes into the livestock and the feed itself, which is crops, has its set of pressures associated with it. There's land use and infrastructure that's required to um, grow these livestock. Of course, they need water, so there's water consumption of the livestock. 
And there's enteric, fer enteric fer fermentation, which also leads to climate emissions. So just within this one group of uh, food production systems, we keep track of these many different things. And you can see for aquaculture, crops, and fisheries, the other aspects of food production that we keep track of. Now, we only look at what we call farm to gate. So the production of the food at the farm, when it leaves the farm or leaves the gate and gets into transportation to other places and trade across the planet, that's beyond the scope of this study. So we're looking at just farm to gate. And that's a pretty common way of looking at um, the environmental pressures associated with food. Now, for each of these food categories and the foods within them, we look at four key pressures, greenhouse gas emissions that affect climate change, disturbance of the land or the sea uh, for the production or harvest of the food, nitrogen and phosphorus pollution that comes from the production, and then freshwater use. Now, these are by far the four dominant main pressures that are studied and assessed in food production, but of course, they're not everything. There are things like disease or antibiotic use or, or other things like that that clearly are important, but um, one, they're not data on them globally, and two, they aren't the dominant things that are paid attention to. So we focused on these four aspects of food production. And then within each of the food groups and the um, activities associated with those food groups, you can see which ones have which pressures associated with them. So nearly all aspects of all food production have a greenhouse gas emissions component. Uh, only half or so have um, pressures associated to disturbance, pollution, or water use. So we keep track of each aspect of the food production across these four different pressures. And then from that, we can measure and map each of the individual pressures associated with any given food or all foods. And we can also measure and map the cumulative pressure, which is the sum of these four different pressures together so that we get that comprehensive view of the additive of, of consequences of these different environmental pressures to calculate and map the total environmental footprint from food production. So we do that for 99% of all reported global food production. There are a few things missing that just aren't reported well in things like FAO. And then of course, we don't include food that's not reported because we, we can't actually get data on it. So all of the like backyard gardening that you might do at your home or hunting for deer if you go, or pigs if you do that, or um, bushmeat hunting in different parts of the world, these kinds of activities, which are really important food sources for many people are not part of our assessment because there's no data on them. But we do capture 99% of all reported global food production. And we count for both these kilogram efficiencies that I spoke to at the beginning and the volume of production across the planet. Okay, now for the, the five chapters, the five stories. Chapter one, the message that we found is that these, the environmental footprint, these pressures from food production are highly concentrated. So if you look at the map, this is the cumulative pressure of those four um, pressures associated with food production for all food together across the oceans and the land. And those bright red spots, that's the top 1% of areas on the planet that are producing environmental pressures associated with food production. You can immediately see they're highly concentrated in India, China, parts of Europe, uh, North America, and then scattered in other places as well. So, you know, just a quick snapshot, you immediately see how concentrated they are. And that top 1%, those red spots, create 40% of the total pressure from global food production. And indeed, the top 10% of area of our planet basically accounts for nearly all of environmental pressure from food production, 93%. So there's two sides to this coin or this uh, result. You know, the, I guess the positive is with it so concentrated, we can target our mitigation strategies to relatively few, few places uh, and in order to try to improve um, sustainability of food production. Of course, the, the downside, the negative is if you happen to live near these high concentration areas, you're being subjected to, you know, the higher levels of environmental pressure from food production. And there's some serious equity and, and justice concerns related to that. 
And I'll show you what the individual pressure maps uh, look like as well, just to see a little bit under the hood of that cumulative pressure. So this is disturbance. And that yellow, light yellow area in the ocean is sort of the, the footprint of wild caught fisheries. And then on land, it's uh, you know the combination of row crops and livestock, mostly row crops. And, and you can see how that's really a key part of the pressure associated of food production in India, China, Europe, and North America, as well as Brazil. The nutrient pollution is even more widespread. It's still concentrated in those um, same areas, but in a lot of other areas as well. This is primarily from um, fertilizer runoff, but also um, uh, manure from livestock. Water, uh, similarly concentrated in places where crops are growing, but as you can see, really widespread across most of the, the landscape of the planet. And then greenhouse gas emissions similarly are coming from pretty much all parts of, of the planet um, with high concentrations in those same geographies as well. So there's overlap in the individual pressures on where they occur, but also key differences that allow for thinking about um, which pressures for which food and which places are the dominant or, or um, majority contribution of the total environmental footprint from food production. And you can use that kind of information to think about strategies for mitigating the overall footprint of food production by key interventions for particular pressures. With that information map, there's a whole bunch of things you can do with it for the first time. So here's just one example where we can look at the contribution of different foods within countries um, and the total uh, environmental footprint of food within countries to see uh, kind of where, which you know, nationalities, uh, which governments we might need to engage with to really start to think about mitigating global food production footprint. So interesting story, just to compare India and China together, they are each about 15% of the total environmental footprint um, of all food. So together it's nearly 30%, but they have really different um, contributions from that. India, it's, you know, well over half of it is from crops for human consumption. Where in China, a significant part of it, that green is from crops for livestock feed. So a real difference in just how crops are grown and used. China also has a significant um, contribution from marine fisheries. There's a much stronger seafood food production within China than in India. And you can look across each of these countries or other countries to see how the relative contribution of different foods adds up to their country level footprint and how countries stack against each other. These top 20 countries account for over 70% of the global cumulative pressure. So again, it's highly concentrated. And again, the, the top five are nearly half. So India, China, United States, Brazil, and Pakistan contribute nearly half of all of food's footprint. Now these are big countries with lots of people. So part of that is not too surprising. But it is, a, I think, a really powerful result to speak to how concentrated these pressures are and what that means for strategies for mitigating those pressures. Okay, chapter two, sort of the, the second set of uh, take home messages is that the way we have looked at this by looking at cumulative pressures across these four different pressures and accounting for efficiency as well as volume of production creates new rank orders of food in terms of their environmental footprint on the planet, different than the rank orders you've probably been seeing in other research or in the news media. So this is the way we look at these results. There's um, contribution to environmental pressures from both the direct production of the food. Those are the lighter colors of beige, pink, brown, and, and blue. And also the contribution from feed. And so uh, these are the darker versions of that. So for in livestock, we have um, both direct and feed contributions to their environmental footprint. And you can immediately see what might be um, a surprising result that pigs are worse than cows. So we've heard a lot about the, the problems with cows, primarily driven by uh, data and information on the climate emissions associated with cows, which is still the case. You see that really big pink bar that is the greenhouse gas emissions from cows and it's much bigger than all the other food groups. 
But pigs have a huge amount of nutrient pollution associated with them that um, cumulatively creates a larger environmental footprint from pig production than cows. And you can see how the other livestock stack up against each other when accounting for these four different um, environmental pressures. If we then look at the um, blue foods, uh, the marine and freshwater fisheries and the mariculture that's farming of the sea, um, you can see uh, in general, they're much less with a few uh, examples that otherwise. And those vertical bars show equivalence in the x-axis. So we stretch the x-axis um, further on the lower two plots to allow to see some of the smaller values. And so the gray vertical bar shows 0.005 equivalence across the three um, plots, for example. So you can immediately see that demersal fish, these are the ground fish that are harvested through very large nets that are dragged by large boats that take a lot of diesel fuel to, to move them, have a large spatial footprint, that's the direct disturbance um, aspect of pressure and pretty large emissions, the pink bar associated with them. Farmed shrimp also have a fairly large environmental footprints, again, from the, the disturbance of the coastal landscape where these shrimp farms are, um, as well as emissions and nutrient pollution in particular that come from them. And you can see how these other um, food groups stack up against each other. When you look at crops, uh, and I'll put it all together in the next slide, you see that rice and wheat top the list, which is probably not something that you had heard before. Um, and then a, a rapid decrease in the cumulative footprint to, as you get to, other, to sort of banana and below, where they're just pretty small global environmental footprints associated with them. So let's put it all together. Again, those vertical lines show equivalency across the plots so that you can compare um, them to each other while stretching out the x-axis to see what's going on. And one of the big take-homes is the top five are pig, cow, rice, wheat, and milk. And my guess is this is not a list that you're used to seeing as a top five. And a key part of that, and a message I'll return to later, is the huge production volume of all five of these things. So they're both not particularly efficient and massive production volumes, which collectively means they have a very large environmental footprint on our planet. Probably not surprising to all of you up there, but fisheries don't have a water or nutrient um, footprint because we don't have to give them water and we don't feed them. And so that uh, immediately removes two of the four pressures associated with, with food production that we're keeping track of here, which inherently makes them more likely to be more sustainable or have a smaller environmental footprint. And then I think, you know, what I hope you're seeing is from this is that this view, this approach to understanding the environmental footprint of food production, where we look at cumulative pressures and account for production volume, tells a really different story about how food is affecting our planet than we get from the vast majority of other research that is looking at the per kilogram efficiency of food production. So I want to turn to that now, these efficiencies, because we do keep track of them as well. Um, but because we have mapped everything for the first time, we can really pay attention to how these efficiencies vary across space in different countries and what that means for thinking about um, strategic food policy that uh, takes advantage of or accounts for these differences. So the third chapter of the story is that these efficiencies are highly variable from place to place. So looking at a single average value does not tell the whole story. So I want to show you this first snippet, and then I'll expand out to all the other food groups to, so you can get a handle on what these plots are showing. So if we look at goat's meat, each dot on this plot is a country. So there should be about 190 or 200 of these dots here. And the dots are showing the environmental inefficiency, so the cumulative pressure per ton of protein in the food. And uh, the ones to the further right are less efficient or more inefficient. And the ones to the left are more efficient or less inefficient. And I've color coded four, uh, I'm sorry, six countries just to keep track of where they are to give examples. So the United States is yellow, which is kind of in, uh, in the middle of that 
box. Uh, India is in red, um, China is in green, Brazil in orange, Indonesia in light blue, and Russia in purple. So the average is right around where Brazil is, that horizontal line in the box. Um, and the box is the 75-25% uh, um, variance around that mean. And you can see that those six countries themselves have variation among them, but across all the countries, there's quite a lot of variation in the efficiency or inefficiency of producing goat meat. So we now look at all livestock. We can see how they stack up. Goat and sheep are now the, the top ranking foods in terms of their inefficiency with cow and pigs ranking next. So this matches a lot of the kind of literature on the efficiency of livestock production, although that's mostly focused on the um, greenhouse gas emissions dimension of livestock. Here we're counting for all four pressures in this cumulative measure. But what you can see is with every single food group, there is huge variation in the environmental efficiency or inefficiency of food production. And the order of those dots, the colored dots that I've, I've highlighted just as examples, changes from food to food. So the efficiency of one food in one country may be better for one food than it is for another food. And we can look at this for the other foods. The main message stays the same. That red vertical line just shows equivalency of the x-axis again. And for every food, there is um, high variation among countries for the most part, every food. Um, and the rank order of foods can change as you move from food to food. And if we add crops there on the bottom, you can kind of see it all stacked together. <clears throat> so take homes from this, uh, I hope it's clear is that you know many crops and seafood are pretty efficient. If you look at aquaculture and many fisheries and many of the crops are really, really um, far to the left, which means they're quite efficient. So they're good, sustainable. <clears throat> but as I have pointed out, there's really wide variation among countries. For crops, it can be anywhere from two and a half to nearly 10 times variation. Um, among countries um, for the, the efficiency or inefficiency of the food production. And for fisheries, it can be up to 22 times difference from country to country. So huge variation within countries. So just one example of that, if we look at soy production between the United States and India, so the United States is the number one soy producer, India, I think is number three or four. The United States is nearly three times more efficient than India. So India is less efficient. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, the United States, we have a lot of regulations around um, agriculture that tries to limit pollution and other emissions. We have a lot of technology, both in farm uh, equipment, but also the seed for soy that allows for higher production with less land disturbance or less effort or less emissions. Um, and access to um, you know, genetic stock of, of soy that can soy seeds that can create more productivity. So there's many reasons for this greater efficiency, but it points to examples of how we can use this information to compare two countries, think about what leads to differences, or not just think, but dig into what leads to differences in those efficiencies, and then think about strategies for targeting policy or trade that can um, take advantage of those differences and and promote or support more sustainable food production. And then also, as I pointed out, there's huge variation among foods within countries. So for example, and you can do many of these kinds of examples, in Indonesia, pigs are nearly seven times less efficient than cows. So if you're gonna eat meat in Indonesia, you'd probably be better off eating beef than pork because beef is much more efficient than pork in Indonesia. And you can do that for all sorts of pairs of food in any given country to make these kinds of comparisons and understand what's happening. So, you know, the rank order of countries changes per food and the rank order of foods changes within each country. And as I've mentioned, these differences really create policy and trade opportunities that we can try to leverage to make for a more sustainable food production system. Okay, chapter four, or message four that I'd love for you to take home from this is the really pivotal role of feed in driving the environmental footprint of food production. So uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. 
One, which many of you may know, is the key role of feed conversion ratios in driving the environmental footprint of livestock or, or fed um, aquaculture. These efficiencies are basically how much uh, food it takes to grow a pound or a kilogram of the animal you're interested in eating. So for cattle, it takes roughly seven pounds or seven kilograms of feed to grow one pound or one kilogram of um, cattle that you can eat. For pigs, it's three to one. For chickens, it's about two to one. And for farm-raised fish, it's getting close to one to one. So these feed efficiencies alone drive a key part of the environmental footprint of livestock and fed aquaculture production because of the amount of feed it takes to grow the food that we then eat ourselves. The other part of um, the story of feed that is from a paper we just published last month, kind of pulling out chicken and farm salmon is just two examples of food that are fed is that our feed is um, being homogenized in, in what we give to fed animals. So you may know or may not know that chicken are actually fed forage fish. So about 25% of all forage fish from the oceans are fed to chicken and pigs. So chicken have an ocean footprint because of the feed. And similarly, farmed salmon are fed crops, soy and other oil crops, uh, so farm salmon in the ocean has a terrestrial footprint. And the environmental footprint of these two um, animals, which are arguably very different, um, are very similar because of feed. So feed is really driving both the extensive footprint of both of these foods, uh, animals, and the similarity of them. So we find feed, you know, again, playing a really critical role in driving the environmental footprint of fed um, agriculture and fed aquaculture. So it really just points out again, the role of feed in understanding these cumulative footprints. So as I said before, crops and wild fisheries, they're not fed. So inherently they're gonna have the potential for a lower environmental footprint. Uh, bivalves like mussels, clams and oysters are also not fed. So aquaculture, there's, some, there's plenty of unfed aquaculture as well. But anything that has feed inputs immediately has a whole nother category of environmental pressures associated with it that come from those feed. So let's look at an example up there on the top in those red boxes, you can see pig meat and I've highlighted in those red boxes, the amount of the cumulative environmental footprint that comes from feed, it's about a third. So about a third of the environmental footprint of pig is from its feed. We can do the same for shrimp down there at the bottom. Again, about a quarter of a third of its environmental footprint is from feed. So you can see, you know, it'll vary by animal, but somewhere between a quarter to a third of the environmental footprint of these fed um, animals is coming from their feed. So that's an immediately uh, key part of what drives the environmental footprint of, of fed um, agriculture. The flip side of that, of course, is that with um, innovation in technology and feed, we have a really key um, intervention point to reduce the environmental footprint of food production. So we're already seeing some really cool things in aquaculture, but also livestock feed innovation around um, including mealworms or microalgae or single cell proteins, and there's a whole bunch of other innovations that can be grown in labs uh, that allow for um, the careful construction of feed components to make them particularly nutritious, both to the animal and ultimately to us, with the potential for much, much smaller environmental footprints associated with them. So there's really exciting opportunities here. So even though um, fed uh, agriculture and aquaculture has a significant contribution from feed to its environmental footprint, it's also a place where innovation and technology can make a really big difference if we're not willing to cut out fed livestock and aquaculture from our diet. There's an exciting example, as you've probably heard some of this in the news of like feeding seaweed to cows to reduce their methane emissions because it somehow makes them burp less. That's really cool. There's you know, still doing more science to see how robust those results are. But even if it's a little bit, 
if you can just change the diet slightly and make an improvement in the climate emissions from cattle har or growing, that's great, right? That's a really exciting part of how we can re reduce the environmental footprint of food production. And the last chapter, the last story I wanna tell is to really focus on the comparison of efficiency and production volume. So I set that up in the beginning and I've hinted at it a bit more, but I really wanna hammer home the results from this, because it is so different than the way most food um, assessments have been done in the past. So look at these two plots again. The top one is efficiency and the bottom one is the cumulative environmental footprint. And I wanna just walk through a couple examples to really highlight how these two pieces of information combine in ways to really understand the environmental footprint of food production. So let's look at pig's meat. On the efficiency scale, it's, yeah, it's inefficient. It's not as bad as goat, sheep, and cattle. Uh, so it's kind of ranked fourth, but it's pretty inefficient. But we grow an enormous number of pigs globally, something like 800 million per year. That's a lot. Uh, and so when you combine both a relatively inefficient food with a massive volume, that's what leads to the really high cumulative total global environmental footprint of pigs and why it is ranked number one when accounting for that. So it's a combination of inefficient and huge production volume. For another example, we can look at chicken, which is actually pretty efficient uh, in its production compared to all the other livestock. But we grow and slaughter a staggering number of chickens each year, 60 billion chickens per year. So even though it's relatively efficient, the production volume is just profoundly huge. And that's why chicken meat ends up being ranked fourth for its total global environmental footprint because of this massive volume of food production. We can do this for a couple of crops too, just to you know, show a few other examples. So if we look at rice, of this isn't all the crops, there's a few above and below it, but it's, it's of medium efficiency for the crops in terms of per kilogram. Um, so it's somewhat inefficient, somewhat efficient, but we grow a huge amount, 510 million tons per year on average of rice. And so that combined makes rice the top ranked crop in terms of its global cumulative environmental footprint. Wheat, on the other hand, is one of the more efficient um, foods that we grow, but again, a staggering amount, 700 million tons per year of wheat, so the combination of that makes wheat the second highest global cumulative environmental footprint food. So I hope this really helps illustrate why we need to pay attention to both of these, because the consequence of food production is both individual choice, that's the efficiency side of it, but the volume of production is really what leads to the environmental footprint and the cumulative overall environmental consequence of food production. So paying attention to both is a really important part of understanding the sustainability of food production around the world. So those are the five chapters and the five stories. What does that leave us with? What, what can we do with this information? How do we make decisions? How do we change the sustainability of food production to hopefully make for a more livable planet for us and for, uh, for nature? I wanna highlight before giving some of those take home messages on what we can do, that there are many reasons that people make food choices and all are very valid. I focus today here on environmental sustainability issues. It's what led me into thinking about why I want to eat what I eat, but all of these other ones are equally valid. My daughter is a vegetarian because of animal welfare reasons. She learned about the CAFOs of, of um, pigs and cattle and chicken and was horrified at what she learned and said, I'm not gonna eat that anymore. So animal welfare reasons are equally important reasons that people make food choices. Nutrition is probably one of the main ones. Uh, people choose food based on what they need to live a healthy life, um, or at least try to anyway. People make choices about food around social justice. There's really important research coming out about, for example, slave labor in the fisheries or horrible wages for uh, migrant farm workers or, or other um, injustices around how food is produced that might lead you to choose one food or another or one producer over another. 
And of course, people are really engaged in their local communities, at um, farmers markets or um, farm boxes that bring local food into your home for your diet and for your meals and supporting local farmers uh, or uh, ranchers in your local community is a, 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 lot, a big reason that people choose food and of course, totally, totally valid. But again, I'm focused on the environmental sustainability side of stuff. And these are the, some of the lessons that I would offer about what we can do to make a difference based on environmental sustainability. So there is always things we can do through our personal choice that can make a difference. So I'd recommend eating less farmed meat. That doesn't mean cutting it out completely. If you eat five portions a week, think about cutting it down to four or three portions a week. If you feel bold, cut it out completely. Farmed meat, it's fed and it has one of the higher cumulative environmental footprints. So it's a, a way that our personal choice can make a difference. Mussels, oysters, and clams. These are unfed aquaculture for the most part and uh, are great. They're nutritious. They uh, have very low environmental footprint. They create habitat. They filter the water of, of nutrient pollution. So there's a lot of great benefits from them uh, and you can kind of eat them basically guilt-free. And then one I always throw in there, uh, it's harder to do, but it's great if you can do it, is eat invasive species. Uh, I was just in Hawaii recently and it is overrun with uh, wild pig or a sort of feral pig. Uh, that were released there and it's wrecking havoc on the natural systems. Uh, if you want to go hunt or have a friend hunt a pig in Hawaii, eat it. It's like guilt-free food. It's tasty. They're eating mangoes and macadamia nuts and the delicious meat and it's helping the environment. So there are ways that you can eat meat that are actually good for the planet too. There are also things we can do with our voice. So the choice is what we do individually, but the voice is how we have a collective uh, impact on uh, food sustainability and really address this issue of volume um, because that's really how we can scale our personal decisions to the scale of national international uh, consequence. So engage locally if you can talk to your farmers or your local politicians about kind of the information you're learning here what you're hearing from other food sustainability studies. How can we make our food systems better for the environment talk to your Congress people or your uh, representatives in your government and see what they can do. And then advocate for national change. I'm not sure what the equivalent in Canada is, but here in the United States, we're in 2023 is when they're renegotiating the farm bill. This is the main way that we can make a huge difference on the sustainability of food production. And you know, local politicians are you know, on these committees that, that guide the drafting of the farm bill or whatever the equivalent is in Canada. Uh, that really can make a big difference by strategically engaging with representatives. So there are things we can do with our voice. It's a little bit harder, of course, but it's how we can have a, a really a big impact at scale. So I encourage actions along these, but mainly just to hopefully take this information that I presented and think about it, digest it, uh, and see how you can use it to uh, help inform your, your decisions about how you eat for a more sustainable planet. So I'll end there. Uh, welcome all questions. Uh, excited to have a conversation about this work and thanks so much for the time. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, it's really interesting and I think relevant to a lot of us. Um, I was wondering, that's a question I've been wrestling with myself. Um, I think it's pretty common practice now to replace some um, animal consumption by dietary supplements uh, for their dietary benefits. And I've been really wondering if there are studies or ongoing studies that weight the environmental footprint of the production of those um, um, yeah, industrial dietary supplements, because it would be really interesting to know if it's actually a good idea or not. Yeah, it's a great question, and I don't know the answer to it. I know there's uh, work that I'm part of and many others and other projects that are looking at the environmental consequences of feed supplements. So I hinted at some of that with that one slide. And I'm uh, whether there are people looking at the dietary supplements that are maybe you know grown in, in lab settings, I, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. I think um, 
one of the interesting things about this, and there's other stories I can tell about um, other alternative food ideas, is that it really comes down to um, whether or not you replace the, the food with the other item or whether you just add it into your diet. And so if, for example, someone continues to eat the same amount of meat or food and then they add in the dietary supplements, it's probably presumably it's good for their health, but it's actually adding to their environmental footprint because you've added a food rather than replaced a food. So we get that story in food system sustainability quite a lot that unfortunately people rarely replace a food, they add a new food in. And so we're actually tend to grow our environmental footprint rather than reduce it or by, by these food substitutions. All right. Well, I would be really interested if somebody worked on that. Uh, yeah. The environmental pressure of food production per capita. Ah, uh, per capita. Yes. You, it, so you're right. It's an, uh, another way of looking at it. And so big countries that have bigger footprint with also have a lot more people in them. Uh, somewhere in our supplementary materials, I think we have that information. I don't have it on the top of my, my head. Uh, it's a pretty obviously easy calculation. You just take the, the cumulative footprint per country and divide by the number of people there. Um, I, the reason we didn't focus on that is um, because of trade, right? So what we're actually doing in our next phase of research on this that's ongoing right now is to start to account for trade and where food is consumed, not just where it's produced, so that we can understand um, basically how much countries may or may not be exporting the environmental footprint of food production by importing food that is maybe less sustainable. Uh, so it's quite complicated to sort out all of those trade routes, but per capita doesn't account for that. So, I mean, most food is produced uh, within country, but a lot of it isn't. And so the per capita transformation doesn't really account for that difference. But uh, yes, we, I'm guessing underlying that question was the fact that big countries with big footprints also have a lot of people in them. So which is true. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that I thought over the, the, the break, because um, I've been trying to accommodate my diet based on, on, on this research, and it's quite complicated. And I was talking to my parents about it. And I also, what, that was even more complicated. So I was wondering if you guys have done like some type of tool or thinking of doing like an online thing where you can just like log in, put in your country and be like, oh, these are like the diet that you, so for more of a lack of outreach and like, like, tell people about this outfit. yeah uh we would love to it's uh you know we we're trying to find some funding and support for it and uh, once you build it you need to maintain it too so there's the like the cost of that um and the other problem is um you know people relate to diet through um, not just the raw materials but the you know the meals they make with it so um or the products they buy in the grocery store which are not always they're often combined of different components so um it would be yes yeah. so the short answer is we'd love to do we're, we're trying to find funding for it it doesn't exist yet uh there is an interesting study that uh, was done last year you may have seen the headlines uh, for the like 52,000 grocery store products were assessed and their environmental consequence. And it was colleagues in, at Oxford that did that, that took the raw material compositions and the, uh, the efficiency measures for those foods, and then went to the grocery store and looked at the ingredient lists and calculated the environmental um, consequence of these 52,000 food products. I think they did create a little tool. So that's a fun one to play around with. It's the efficiency side of stuff. It doesn't account for the volume, the production volume, and it doesn't account for the location, like where the food is grown. So it's missing the two pieces that I really focused on here, but it's a fun thing to play around with and start to build a little bit more intuition around our food choices. Um, so my, my question is, which I'm still kind of formulating, so you might have to bear with me here. Um, is that you mentioned that there's a smaller environmental footprint from wild fisheries, um, but wild fisheries are the only food sector that you discussed extensively that is wild and not cultivated. Um, 
And there are many fisheries that we are not managing well because of the limitations in managing something that is wild rather than cultivated and easily counted and managed. Um, so how do we account for those management and transparency issues in their environmental footprint that you were kind of comparing amongst foods? Yeah, fantastic question. And I'll first add in another point and then try to answer your question. The other thing that um, I didn't speak to directly is, you know, fisheries and, and aquaculture are unbelievably diverse. And so hidden under those, you know, seven or eight food groups per category of fisheries or aquaculture are hundreds of different species that all have different um, efficiency and production volumes associated with them. We just don't have data reported at that granularity to track it. Whereas for the crops and the livestock, you saw it's, too, well, not always, it's fruits and vegetables was lumped together. So there's another example of a, a big group, but a lot of them, you know, the big ones, we have individual animal species or individual crops that we keep track of separately. So in these aquatic foods, there's a huge diversity that we didn't account for. And there's a few, probably a few bad actors and then lots of much, much better um, more efficient foods within there. But to your question, you're right. I mean, clearly, uh, uh, poor management of a stock uh, that's over harvested is, it might be environmentally footprint sustainable, but it's not long term sustainable. And that is something that we couldn't account for very well in our uh, analysis because we were looking at a single snapshot in time and there's aspects of sustainability like deforestation for creating new grazing lands that is a horrible consequence of food production but requires assessment over time to really start tracking the consequence of that so if we started to expand what we did to look at things over time would create a mechanism for us to better account for over harvest or unsustainable harvest of fisheries um, so it doesn't fit into the four categories that we were keeping track of, but it is clearly critical for the long-term provision of food, which is just not something we were keeping track of in, in this uh, assessment. All right. All right. Uh, so did I hear you say, Ben, about, uh, in the last question, I might've misunderstood. Did you say that there is not very much information about the different species of aquaculture? <laughs> Correct. I mean, we know a lot about the big ones, you know, tuna, shrimp, salmon, tilapia, catfish, but there's hundreds of other species. That... Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the tilapia and uh, carp, I think there's a lot, and, and catfish. Yes. In the United States, catfish is like number one, right? And there's tons of information on that. Absolutely. I didn't mean to imply otherwise. Sorry. Oh, okay. Bit... Yeah. But uh, so I've been, a lot of my career has been spent looking at alternatives for aquaculture feed ingredients, including um, including terrestrial plant materials, but also um, more recently looking at um, uh, byproducts of fishing itself. So looking at offal being uh, offal from uh, the Pollock uh, harvesting industry, for example, uh, not, and and more recently, even still, uh, looking at black soldier fly larvae and uh, algae oil, uh, oil derived from algae grown in big vats. And uh, anyway, I just wondered about, so turning, the, the advantage of things like black soldier fly is that, I guess the term is circular, circular economy, where you take the byproducts of one, turn it into co-products, for use in a different production, that would make your calculations kind of challenging, I should think. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're right, we, it, you have to do careful bookkeeping to keep track of, of, you know, if there are, I mean, manure can be put on the fields to replace fertilizer, for example, it's another example of how agriculture is long, kind of done a practice that makes it essentially more sustainable. So we, we actually, that example we did account for as best we could of how, where and how much manure is put onto fields. But your example, you're right, it's, it is a, it's an accounting challenge. You have to make sure you get data and information on how much is used versus not used for, through kind of uh, additional food production systems. It's not impossible, but 
a big message for us in all of this was that, I mean, this is not new to anyone who's done any aspect of science is like, you need the data to do it. And there Absolutely. are unfortunately not um, great data reporting in a lot of places for a lot of things. So, And, and, and the other thing that's a little bit um, also would be challenging and similar is what's sometimes called uh, uh, yeah, multi-trophic integrated multi-trophic yeah. aquaculture, you know, uh, where you, you grow mussels and, uh, or oysters or some kind of filter feeder or algae next to a fish farm. And underneath the fish farm, you'll have some uh, benthic feeders that, that eat that. And the idea being overall, each one of them may not be very efficient or may have, an, you know, uh, uh, may have some elements that are not efficient, but the whole system now is more efficient. And again, yeah. I can imagine an, an accounting nightmare. This is why I'm not an accountant. <laughs> yeah, it's also really difficult to scale multi-trophic aquaculture right now. So it's a, a, a nice um, small scale idea to really provide large volume of food. It's not yet figured out how to do that well. But you're right, it is also an accounting challenge. But you could treat it as a whole system rather than individual parts, potentially. So, yeah. Cool. Very interesting. I appreciated your talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Thank you, Ian. And sorry, Jen, we're um, running over time. So we're unfortunately going to have to close this session. Um, but I hope it's okay, Ben, to indicate that people should follow up with you with any questions they might have. Absolutely, yeah. Please reach out by email or otherwise and, and follow up. I, I, I love having follow-on conversations and, and so please do. Um, so thanks on behalf on, of everyone at the Institute for Oceans of Fisheries for doing this presentation for us. Thank you.